is so wonderful to see you all here today. Um, I love to go to events with alumni. I love to go to events with our faculty and staff and my colleagues, but nothing makes me happier than to see a room full of students. Um, uh, you know, coming to college is the first amazing thing you did. Coming to things like this, though, and participating um, in all that you can get from a San Francisco State education sets you apart from others. So thank you for being here today. Um, I, I want to um, welcome all, especially our guests and visitors today. I want to thank Dean Sivadis for having created this lecture series. Um, I want to thank the faculty in the Lamb Family College of Business. I'm sure some of you, this is integrated into your coursework, as it should be. Um, others, you've just had it promoted. So uh, thank you to the faculty and, of course, again, to the students. Um, it's this kind of experience, getting to listen to our speakers, that's going to take what you learn in the classroom and propel you to a different place. Um, I want to, th this lecture series and many of the things you do in the Lamb Family College of Business um, are due to the generosity of Chris Larson and Lena Lamb. So as always, I'm deeply grateful. Um, I, I'm going to, uh, Chris will get more formally introduced, but I, I want to encourage you all, not now, but afterwards to Google his name. And you're going to hear about his business successes, but what I think, and, and they're tremendous and they're incredible, but if you look at anything important happening in the life and texture of San Francisco, you're going to see Chris Larson's name attached to it. And to me, that's kind of symbolic of the way our alumni and our students think. Um, uh, you know, and actually, I think I've once told, I was even in a, the London Underground and saw Ripple advertised there. Uh, and then Chris is regularly in the Chronicle for the work he's doing to help bring San Francisco back, bring San Francisco back or, or unleash our potential. So um, it is such an honor to have him with us today. And then I want to thank Marty Chavez for being here um, uh, speaking. Um, you have the opportunity to hear two men whose experiences and successes the gene used the word legendary. This is legendary, and you have the opportunity to learn from that. So, um, again, a warm welcome to our two speakers and incredible gratitude to all of you who are here today to make this event spectacular. Thank you, President Mahoney. And now I don't think I can do justice to uh, the introduction, but I'll try. Uh, welcome to the Fireside uh, Conversation. Dr. Martin Chavez is a multifaceted figure, an accomplished computer scientist, entrepreneur, and investor. He holds bachelor's and master's degrees from Harvard University and his uh, doctoral degree from Stanford. Uh, presently, he serves as vice chairman of Sixth Street Investments, which is an influential player in the alternate investments and with an AUM of approximately $40 billion. Um, Dr. Chavez has previously held positions of CFO and CIO at Goldman Sachs and is currently serves on the board of directors at Alphabet, the parent company of Google and Recursion Pharmaceuticals. His groundwork, work, groundbreaking work on SecDB an early platform that revolutionized the trading industry into a software-driven enterprise has earned him unparalleled recognition within the financial services sector. He's also one of the first uh, Latinx individuals to reach the highest echelons of Wall Street. So thank you, sir. And of course, Chris Larson, uh, is a, we are very proud that he's an alumnus of our uh, college. And subsequently, he furthered his education with an MBA from Stanford. He's the co-founder of numerous startups, including Elon and Ripple. The Lamb Family College proudly bears the, his father-in-law's name, which is a testament to his uh, tr transformative generosity. Thanks to the significant contribution from Chris, his spouse, Lena Lamb, and Ripple Works Foundation, we are empowered to launch a variety of initiatives, including this lecture, and these initiatives encompass student engagement, community involvement, innovation and entrepreneurship, as well as FinTech and emerging technologies. Uh, the impact of this philanthropy has also made possible the creation of an innovation hub and a forthcoming financial laboratory with Bloomberg tickers and such, and a career services center. So thank you both. Please uh, come to the stage and get us started. Thank you.
Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. How's that? Good. Yes. Thank you. Well, thanks so much again, Lynn. That was an incredible introduction. And I hope uh, you're going to be back on the skis soon here. So we're, uh, Marty, uh, it's so great to meet you. Uh, and just want to thank you so much for coming out here to, to uh, this wonderful group of folks here. Oh, it's an honor. Thank you for inviting me. So I thought what we try to do is just try to have a discussion about all your incredible uh, work and background uh, aimed at, at trying to inform all these wonderful students about kind of the futures they're going to be facing. I know when I went here, uh, you know, the world looks like a pretty daunting place, right? But there's so much going on. And I think you just navigated it so well. So, and your background's incredible. I mean, Goldman Sachs, Sixth Street, uh, Stanford, uh, Harvard. You probably couldn't get an SF State, I guess, but <laughs> those are pretty good schools. So good job on that. But uh, so, uh, you know, I thought what we do is maybe just start off and, and you know, look, we can take this conversation in any direction. Um, but just maybe some of the first uh, orders of business is talking about some of the challenges that you faced. And I know we were about the same age. We grew up in a in a different time, so the obstacles are are unique. But uh, I think whatever we can draw to help all these tremendous people navigate their their futures. So what would you what would you sort of call out? Well, I think I'd have to start with my mom and dad like a lot of people. Um, my I'm from New Mexico originally, and we have been in New Mexico forever. We like to say that the United States immigrated to us. Uh, we were there first. And well, we were not actually the Native Americans way before us, but we go back to the 1500s. And yet uh, in Albuquerque, where I grew up, even though we were the majority we were we were definitively the underclass so that was a an odd setup right 70 percent hispanic but it was very clear uh that we were not in charge of absolutely uh anything and uh my mom's quite a quite a character uh she grew up in the barrio and for reasons no one quite understands uh, she decided at the age of 10, she made a, a vow that she was either, it was a two-part vow, either A, have 10 children and send them all to Harvard, or B, be a nun. So clearly she was not a nun, um, and and she's a tough grader, so she gives herself a 50% uh, for having five children and sending them all to Harvard. And... I think that dynamic of of someone in the barrio who just said we can we can get out of here um, was how I grew up, um, but it created a lot of a lot of tension. We were proud of our family, and at the same time, we were embarrassed that most of our family was in the barrio, and we wanted to be a part of them, and we wanted to be outside of them. And so I think working through that conflict has really been the, the story of my life. No, that's, uh, I think that's such a common uh, kind of experience in today's America, right? So in, in the mental picture that you had in trying to overcome obstacles, is it one of being a fighter or is it a one of trying to sort of be part of the system? Or how would you, how would you think about that? So that's a great question. Um, so I would say not so much um, a fighter, but the best way to think of our family was it was a bootstrapped startup. Hmm. So we don't have anything and this is the goal and we're going to do backward induction one step at a time. How, how are we going to get to that, to that goal? And I was, uh, I was very good at math as a kid and I was going to the local parochial school and the teachers said to my parents, um, you should send Marty to to the private school called Albuquerque Academy. And well, so you can picture it. It's an amazing school in Albuquerque. It was a land grant school. So it had resources that were way out of whack with the rest of the city. And it was not for Hispanic kids. I was the in a city that's 70 percent 
Hispanic when I went to that school in fifth grade. And I'm so grateful to that school. It changed my life. I was the only Hispanic kid out of, out of 600. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, and I really upset the natural order of things because I was very good at math and I absolutely got tormented for, for that. And so, so being, knowing I was gay, knowing I was Hispanic and being freakishly good at math and tormented by the Anglo-Saxon majority was kind of <laughs> my growing up. But you made it through that. Is it is it uh, a notion of sort of turning anger into motivation, or how would you, how do you think about that? Uh, I would say it's more, you know, the 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 people who had reason to be angry were maybe my parents' generation. Mm -hmm. I just I was just lucky, mm -hmm. and I felt lucky that I had the gift of math, and I had parents who made the education of the kids, their top 100 priorities mm -hmm. and everything else came after that. And so I just, I really just wanted mom and dad to be, to be proud yeah. and I'm grateful for that. But it, it started this dynamic of like, no, no achievement is enough. I have to keep going. And something that my mom drilled into our heads, which I'm grateful for, and I spend a lot of time with my therapist on is um, is that uh, she would always say you're Hispanic boohoo you're going to have to work twice as hard to get half as far and you better get busy so no no complaining no was allowed complaint. okay all right I like that Making parents proud, that is a big deal, I think, right? Maybe it... That was a big part of it. And the other thing that I internalized for my mom, and, you know, she is, she is uh, uh, being politically correct is not a priority for her, mm. right? So I got to, to talk in her voice, but she would, she would say, um, and it is not the Anglo's fault. Mm. That was another constant narrative right because we, you could really hear that right we're mm -hmm. the we're the underclass and it's their fault and my mom would say if 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 we in this the hispanic people in this city cared about education as much as we care about cars and boyfriends and girlfriends we would be in a different place huh. that's interesting so, hardcore how do you think that translates to now by the way you know I think what I internalized for my mom was that education is extremely important. I think as life has gone on, I, I still see that that's not enough. And there's a lot about our system that's, that's way out of whack. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, I've been working on enough self-awareness to know that I was really lucky to be born into my family. Mm -hmm. I was really lucky to go to the schools that I went to. And I was extremely lucky to be good at math. And I didn't mm -hmm. do anything to deserve any of that. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. I wonder if uh, in your parents' generation, the notion of you can't change society. So don't even try, right? Maybe that's... I that was that's very... Whereas now maybe that's different, right? That was very, very much a part of my yeah. parents' generation. I, yeah. I, I always wonder about the counterfactual. If my, if my mom had gone to the schools I went to, hmm. you know, she'd be. Yeah. I think she'd be, uh, you know, president. That's cool. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hats off to mom. Um, can you talk about mentors? Uh, mentors that you other than your parents mm. right that you had that were critical uh, how would you look at that looking backwards and do you mentor people today oh yes I I, I mentor people at scale I would say oh. and I just uh it's uh um I I have keep lists it's just I've got maybe a hundred mentees something like that um and it's just uh and one of the challenges like how do you give the right attention but i'm going to to call out a few people i've been incredibly fortunate to have some powerful mentors and then i'd want to distinguish a mentor from a sponsor 
And I'll get to that in a second because mm. we've had some amazing sponsors as well. <clears throat> and they get all the credit. Mm. Um, I had uh, an English teacher when I was um, growing up in Albuquerque who taught me how to write. And he knew I was gay, but we never talked about it. And that would have been a very difficult conversation in the 70s in mm -hmm. Albuquerque and from a mega Catholic family like mine. But he somehow managed to reach out to me through books and taught me how to write. And that has been probably my most valuable skill next to math. Um, then when I got to college, there was a professor of computer science who took me under his wing. And also all my brothers and sisters, whether they were computer science majors or not. Mm -hmm. So we're grateful to him. Freshman year, there was a biochemistry professor recruiting majors for the biochem department. And he's sitting opposite me on the opposite side of a table. And he says, what are you to 16 year old me? I'm a, like, And I said, <laughs> I'm a computer scientist, uh, which was aspirational. And he said, the future of biology is computational, wow. which was a very strange thing to say in 1981. Mm. Now it makes sense, mm. but then it was just weird, right? And he was one of the people who was working on crystallizing proteins. Mm. And he said, this is a problem we may never solve, but what we're going to do is we're going to crystallize one protein at a time, and we're going to record their structure in a data bank. And skipping wow. many years forward, that's the data bank that our friends at Alphabet mm -hmm. used at AlphaFold to solve the protein folding problem. So I got an early look at that through him. He promised me that if I signed up as a biochem major, which was my undergraduate major, that I'd only have to take one wet lab class, which was great because I never got a single laboratory experiment to work at all. Mm -hmm. But I was really good at doing software simulations of scientific processes. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've been doing all my life. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to Goldman Sachs years later, I had a sponsor. So what's the difference between a mentor and a sponsor? Mm. Uh, a mentor can give you pearls of wisdom, which is great. And by the way, on, on your mentor, uh, one thing that I can tell you, since I have a lot of mentor, mentees, is if someone messages me on LinkedIn and says, will you mentor me? Mm. I appreciate <laughs> it, but I've got a hundred. Yeah. If someone comes to me on LinkedIn and says, and here's what I will do in return. I don't need anything. But if someone says, I will pay it forward, like, is there some project that you're working on where you can, where I can help out? That's someone who definitely gets my attention. And so mentoring is bi-directional, right? It's not a one way from the mentor. You, you need to pay it forward. A sponsor is a mentor who is actually in a position to change your life, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This is someone who can say, oh, you're in the wrong job. Here's the right job, mm -hmm. right? There's someone who can decide whether to promote you or not. Take a bet on you. And at, at Goldman, I saw somebody early on and I knew he was going places and He's the CEO of Carlisle now, one of the mm. huge private equity firms. Um, at that time, we were just partners. We were kind of low, low level. I wasn't even a partner yet. And I said to him, I will give you math and software superpowers mm. and contribute to your success. Mm. And he said, and I will look after you. And we, we lived that for 20 years. Mm. Everywhere he went, I went. That was powerful. And then I'll, I'll, I'll call out my, my most recent mentor. He's been my mentor for 12 years. Uh, there's a great story. Um, through a series of catastrophes, I found myself chief information officer of Goldman Sachs. It was not a job I planned to have, but there were many epic algorithmic trading mm -hmm. errors that, and suddenly, boom, I'm the new CIO. Sounds like all downside. All downside <laughs> and, uh, and, and the, the CEO, Lloyd, said, I'm going to give you a mentor. And I thought that was very sweet because I was 40 some years old and he'd had many years to give me a mentor. Um, but now was the time. And then I forgot about it. I, I didn't take mm -hmm. it seriously. 
And then I got uh, a week later, I got an email from E. Schmidt at Google.com. Mm. This is Eric Schmidt. He was the CEO of Google at the time. And his first message said, I'd like to come to your office and introduce myself. Wow. And I thought this is so backwards. I, well, I, I should go to his office and the man has changed my life. Mm. And what's funny is many people would tell me, oh, I, I talked to Eric the other day and he, he said that you've been such an awesome mentor to him. Mm. And like the 10th time that happened, I, I thought, no, no, this is backwards. And then I asked Eric and he said, of course, you're my mentor. Whenever I want to know anything about finance, you're the first person mm. I call. And so it's been very bi-directional. And for many years, and we made it very efficient, I'd have a question. I'd be at a career inflection point. I'd what WhatsApp him. Mm. If I if I took out my phone and WhatsApped him right now, he would start typing within seconds. I don't know how he does it. Mm. And I just lay out the question and I'd say choice A, choice B. And he would write A. <laughs> 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 okay. call me when you have executed it and you right? do that and and i have always <laughs> done that and I'm like boy this is very efficient and that's, he's always given me amazing advice that's an interesting insight that a mentorship does not have to be vertical or, or hierarchy it can be horizontal exactly. or even maybe the other way huh? does not have to be one of my mentees um ed goldman was a brand new analyst and i was chief financial officer and he wanted to get my attention and he knew a little bit about me and he said, here's what I'm going to do. First half hour of our session is going to be me telling you about all the latest APIs. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I'll ask you some questions. And so I go around here in Silicon Valley and people would say, how do you even know that? Right. Because I was always on top of the latest APIs, which are changing every minute. Yeah. And it was, I told him, there's a 22 year old young man who works at Goldman Sachs, and he is my oracle for all this stuff. That's pretty cool. Uh, not sure if this is really, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask this one. So, aside from sponsors or mentors, are there moments in your life where just somebody, friend or acquaintance or whatever, said one thing that changed your life? Because I know for me, uh, there is a couple people like that. One thing that changed Like a life. sentence or, yes. or a phrase. Well, Okay. The future of biology is computational. That changed my life. That's cool. I yeah. just went in a completely different direction. I would I never thought of biology at all. And now you're on until a, that moment. And we're going to talk about it in, in a, a little bit. Well, later, this is the moment the of AI biology and, and AI yeah. coming together. It took a it took a few decades, but it but it is happening now. That's pretty cool. Um, Eric also changed my life. Uh, funny story for the computer geeks among you. So in our first mentoring session he sits down and the first thing he says to me was have you seen your data centers hmm. and i said excuse me and he said it's not a trick question you're the chief information officer hmm. of a huge bank have you seen your data centers? And all I could think is, I'm a software guy. I've never seen the data centers. I don't know. Do you even know where they are? Hmm. No, I do you know how many there are. No, I have no idea. And he said, I'll hmm. tell you something. Because you're the CIO, if you ask your team for a tour of the data centers, they will have to give you one and hmm. they will not want to <laughs> they will not want you in there and they won't want you to see it and and he was right like mm -hmm. that moment i i took the tours i saw computers with cobwebs on them and blinking lights and it was terrifying like, <laughs> what are they doing <laughs> right it can't be good and that's what he wanted me to to realize that this was a really hard problem to stay on top of what is going on in all those computers in an organization at scale and to know that they were doing the right thing. And he wanted me to be deeply aware of the physicality mm. of computation, which I was totally abstract for me, right? Mm. 
And, and now here we are in 2023. And if you look at any of these big tech firms, the CapEx is astronomical. Super relevant. Yeah. And super relevant. And so that, that, changed my life as well that's that's really interesting yeah for me uh i had a professor at stanford jim collins he 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 just said cut the lifeboats that was it meaning our students weren't taking enough risk for all you people here right what do you think students they (laughs) overestimate risk right Cut the lifeboats yeah well i mean it's easy for us to say from our vantage point but you know looking back at my younger self i take all the risk right you know pay your food and rent and, 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 but that's the time Yeah, and, and fail and fail again and again. I've, you know, learned as an, a cliche, but for so much of my life, everything went exactly the way I wanted it to go hmm. because I was good at math. I got away with murder because I was good at math. And then I really learned nothing about myself until things did not go the way I wanted it to Mm. go, right? I started a company, raised a bunch of money, and one week later, the dot-com bubble burst. And that first capital raise was the highest valuation my company ever had. Mm. It went straight downhill from there. And then we had a a sponsor, a collaborator, who was putting our software on their platform for energy trading, a company called Enron. And then they went bankrupt and then two planes flew into the building next door. Yeah. So we couldn't get into our office for, you know, ever and all the other you know, insanity that happened in New York. You just every last thing went wrong. Mm-hmm. But out of that, that's when I, that's when I learned when you don't have anything and you need real clients, real customers to pay real cash money for a product that they value and to pay on time and to design something with the product market fit. I learned everything then when the chips were down and before that didn't learn much of anything. Yeah, that's a good topic to maybe we can explore a little bit. Uh, I always think Silicon Valley is built on the acceptance of failure. Um, and I've failed many times. Uh, and I think that's why we talk about students and overestimating risks because you have lots of time to get up and keep going and all that. But how do you think about failure for people in this audience, how they should approach it? And when you do fail, there's a right way to fail and there's a wrong way to fail. Do you want to talk about that as well? Well, um, if you're running a company, the wrong way to fail is to not make payroll. And it it startles me how many companies fail in that way, right? One day, there's just no paychecks. And it happens a lot, as you know, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, if, you, if the right way to fail is if you've got any kind of introspection or analytics, you know how much cash you've got. Like everybody needs to know their cash out date, right? Yep. And 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 that cash out date needs to include severance and lots of other things. So there is there is the right way to fail. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. I guess related to that, and let's talk about you know a school we both went to had some issues here recently with you know Elizabeth Holmes and FBF uh, yes. SBF. We won't talk about him, uh, and yes. even the president of Stanford. Not- uh, what do you think about ethics in today's world? Are universities doing enough um, or should we be doing more? And then I guess related, since you're, you've also, of course, been in the investment space, America's always known for this animal spirits thing, mm. much more so than, let's say, Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Europeans respect us for that. But how do you reconcile ethics, particularly in finance, and, and the animal spirits that we need to be competitive? Well, animal spirits is the the right word if you've ever worked on a trading floor. Um, it's gotten much more civilized, uh, but it was not terribly far from Animal House back in the back in the eighties. Wolf of Wall Street and the nineties. Wolf, Wolf of Wall Street and uh, well, we've learned a bunch of a bunch of things. So you talked about about Stanford, and then all of these they're failures. There's no other way. To describe the and, and their bad failures and their 
uh, as a real opportunity for a lot of introspection. Um, at uh, On Wall Street, we also had opportunities for introspection. Um, there, there's a saying on Wall Street, any town of 50,000 has a jail, mm. right? So you got 50,000 employees and somebody's, somebody's doing something. Um, and one of my partners, legendary chief of staff um, at Goldman, John Rogers, used to say, and I, I understand it now, he would say every time there's a failure like that, it's someone who wasn't properly hugged as a child. Huh. Hmm. So that's a deep thought for you. That's interesting. And yeah. uh, and I I like to think that a major reason that I got promoted on Wall Street is I just, um, when it comes to certain things, and I think it's back to mom and dad, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just a, I'm just a boy scout, right? It doesn't, doesn't look right. Doesn't sound right. It's probably not right. Um, I think one of my challenges has been um, early in my career, I would be clever enough to say, doesn't sound right. I'm not going to have anything to do with that. Mm. A, a much harder move that required more self-confidence and probably more seniority was stop talking about this deal idea right now. Mm. We are not going down this path mm. and please get out of my office. Huh. Right? Okay. So that I think is more <laughs> yeah. ethics, ethics in action. And yeah. it's always a work in progress. And we, all have our blind spots and we yeah. all have clay seat and we all make mistakes. Um, and uh, I'm right up there with everybody else in that category, but, but knowing what's important and, and we used to always say at Goldman Sachs, we can teach you a lot of things and there's no mm -hmm. substitute for a good upbringing. Yeah. So the parents were tough, but they gave lots of hugs, lots of hugs. I'm the remember <laughs> you guys all have family. So, um, what do you think now, though? The have times changed? Have has the have the generations changed? Like, what do you see in the in the younger folks coming through? or these or, all these organizations that you're involved in? Sure, I um. So I see I see a bunch of things, <laughs> and everything I say is probably going to sound like you know some 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 old guy, different different generation. Um, one thing that I that I saw was i think an artifact of getting a lot of pushing from from parents i remember the first time a parent wanted to talk to me about their child's career mm -hmm. as in wanting to know when their child was going to get promoted mm -hmm. and I, I view this entirely as a failure of the parental generation, <laughs> right? But that that was something that I wasn't really prepared for. Mm. I didn't even know where to go with that. Yeah, our parents would have never done. No, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. So I, I I see some of that. Mm. Um, one thing that I see that I that I understand, I I think, and I really appreciate, um, there on Wall Street. There's a lot of pressure to conform. Mm. And there were some areas where I would conform. So you have to wear a coat and tie. You used to. For, mm. for decades, we, we only dropped mm. the coat and tie rule in 2019 wow. at, 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 at Goldman. So it was a really long time. Mm. And I hated having that thing around my neck. It seemed bizarre, right? And I appreciate about the younger generation that there are just some things that are important and non-negotiable mm. um work-life balance is seems to be one of those things mm. i've always thought that was important and that made me an outlier in my generation mm. so i think this is an area where i have much more in common with the up-and-coming uh, generation, yeah. but I would say the way I've reconciled it for myself, and I and I offer it if it's useful, please. If not, forget it. But 
a, a, a legendary partner of Goldman Sachs once said to me when I was promoted, she, she, has, she pulled us all together and she said, I know you are all concerned about work-life balance mm -hmm. and I'm going to set your minds at ease on that topic by telling you there is no such thing. It does not exist and you can all stop worrying about it. <laughs> and then I thought, well, that's not very helpful, but, um, and then, but then she said, but here's what does exist, your short sacred list of your personal priorities. Mm -hmm. Top three, know them, own them, make all choices according to that list. There will be consequences and don't expect anyone, not your spouse, not your family, not your boss, not your colleagues to help you with your priorities mm -hmm. or to care about them they're yours. Hmm. And I, I deeply, deeply internalized that. And I came up with my list. And I'm not saying it's a great list, or it's a list that makes sense for anybody else. But it is my list. And my top priority is my peace of mind. Hmm. More important than anything else. I think that that has kept me out of trouble. Right? If I just if I'm going to do this thing and then not be able to sleep afterwards, then I'm not going to do it. Right. And it's, it's not anything other than I'm just going to be tormented internally mm -hmm. and I don't want to do that. And number two, Oh, and by the way, peace of mind incorporates health, yeah. sleep, all kinds of things. Yeah. And then my number two priority is my kids. I've got two kids. And sometimes people say they're your number two, I've seen a lot of people who say their kids are their number one priority and they don't see them. Right. And it's not like, it doesn't seem like they're running their life with their kids as their number one yeah. priority. And then my number three priority is my work. I always tell people I'm dating right off the bat, don't get between me and my work. You'll lose. Mm. It's not going to work. And that's, been a great set of priorities for me and i find in wall street if if your work isn't in your top three priorities yeah. you should go do something else yeah. it's it's going to be painful mm -hmm. right but then if you're one of those people for whom work is your number one priority i think that's cool i support you I think it's creepy and I don't want to hang out with you. Right. right? But it's okay for others. Uh, kind of considering this audience here, uh, mostly younger folks. Uh, how do you think about when you're first starting out? Like, I know for me, it seemed like it was just work, work, work. Yeah. Right? So you can get to a place where you can have balance, but mm -hmm. then some people never get there. Or do you think you start right off the bat in your twenties with, with the balance? Is that possible? That's such, such a good question. I remember, so have an anecdote to answer that. One time I was, um, at that point in my career, I was co-head of our equities business. And young person who works, sits 10 feet outside my office on the trading floor, gets on the calendar, comes in, and comes in hot and says, it's all fine for you to be out of the closet because you're the boss. Mm. But for me in the trenches there, it's not. Mm. And, and I want to understand, like, I know that his reality 10 feet away from me mm. is very different than mine. Yeah. So I empathize and I respect that at the same time, all I could think of to say was, the only reason I stayed in this business long enough to be the boss is that I was just myself. Mm. I am ter a terrible at presenting an alternate version of myself. Yeah. It's not very convincing mm. and it's a waste of time and it's exhausting. And so it's not any noble urge. I just am not any good at that. You, and so I haven't done that. You were out since the beginning then very beginning, I came out, I outed myself in my job interview 
at Goldman Sachs in 1993. Okay. And that had never happened before. And then when I actually got there for my first day, um, I realized I was the only out gay person in the whole company. Wow. And there were maybe five out gay people in the entire industry. Wow. Right. But I just I thought I'll I'll figure something out in Silicon mm-hmm. Valley. It was a bad time in Silicon Valley, which mm-hmm. is why Goldman Sachs got to me. But I thought I, I don't need to go back into the closet mm. uh, for some job on Wall Street. Something yeah. will happen in Silicon Valley. Wow. Uh, that's fascinating. Um, should we maybe switch gears a, a little bit because we touched on AI and biotech. So you're in a bunch of biotech I am. companies and advising would love to hear about what, I mean, we hear some, obviously so many things now about AI. What is the impact of AI? Let's start in biotech, but then I'd love to hear you. I mean, you're an alphabets board. Is AI uh, only going to benefit the big platforms? Are the middle startups screwed? I've, you probably saw some Sam Lesson has a interesting it did. report on this, uh, which sounds rings true, I guess. Love to hear your your thoughts across the board there and the things you're involved in. So um, so we only in our careers have a couple of tricks. I'm sure you you have a couple of very powerful tricks. I, I think I got one, which is to build a software simulation or a digital twin mm-hmm. of some scientific or fin- financial or industrial process. And I've been doing that my whole life and it works really well. So AI just supercharges that. Mm. And, you know, my, my PhD was in artificial intelligence in medicine. Now, what year was that, by the way? 1991. Wow. 1991. And it was one of the many nuclear winters of artificial intelligence. And so when, when people would ask me, what's your PhD? And I would say it's a PhD in artificial intelligence. <laughs> because what we could do was so yeah. late and small compared to our aspirations. Um, and I, I'll tell you what, something very important. You got to pick your problem domain well. So there was another student in the same program mm-hmm. and he said, medicine is too hard. Hmm. I'm going to use the same techniques to solve an interesting, easier, and important problem of what movie to watch tonight. And Uh that (laughs) is Reed Hastings, right? So, wow. wow. Yes. So, you know, same program. It's a little known fact, artificial intelligence and medicine to movies, right? Hmm. And then I went to finance. Why did I go to finance? Because Finance had problems that were much easier to solve yeah. than medicine mm-hmm. and had enough pain and desire to pay to solve those problems. Totally agree with that one. And yeah. that one, yeah. that one, that one worked out pretty well. Mm-hmm. But now I'm going to go out on a limb and say we're in the second half of the chessboard. The computers just keep doubling. Mm-hmm. And now we are able to do amazing things. AlphaFold, I'll just cite as an example of what is going on because I think it's profound and I think it's a model for many things. So if you talk to Demis Sassabis, who is the 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 brains behind AlphaFold and many people worked with him on it, he would say, this is what happened. They took those 50,000 protein structures from the data bank and I, I, I worked on one of those. I worked on crystallizing the tomato bushy stunt virus coat. You mm-hmm. don't forget a name like that. Mm-hmm. And so there's 50,000 proteins. And then he had AlphaFold guess the structures of 75,000 proteins mm-hmm. whose structure was not known. And then this is the dangerous step. Feed the guesses back into AlphaFold. Mm. And then it guessed 250 million structures. Wow. And they've all been correct. Wow. So there was something about this loop, that this kind of bootstrapping, like we mm. talked about before. You went from 50,000 base, you guessed, and now you had everything. So somehow <clears throat> the LLMs found the deep pattern mm. and then could do everything else correctly. And so this is what we are dreaming of in biology right now. Yeah. Do can we train the LLMs 
and then have a fundamental frontier model of all biology. And I have conviction that we will find this model. Hmm. I personal view, not a not an institutional view, think that that liftoff is not that far away. Mm -hmm. Liftoff is the term where we tell the AI, here's all the textbooks, here's all the journal articles, now deduce everything that's de that you can deduce from there and complete the science and then create the next generation of yourself, right? This kind of closing the loop, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's liftoff. I think it is not that far away. I think it's this decade in medicine and biotech specifically or I think in a lot of things a lot of things so if that's the case just within bio uh and you you're also involved with this idea of living longer right? yes uh why do so many questions to ask here <laughs> how long are all these people gonna say the average what's the average age here what do you think 22 what 25 okay 22. really young Very okay young. really young people <laughs> Gosh. um how long are they gonna live and uh, are people going to be having babies at 70? I mean, this is what some of these groups are, are talking about, right? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, what my doctor told me. So I did one of these exams where they scan you from top to bottom. And I'm, I'm going to be 60 in, in February. And he said... Welcome to the club. Yeah. <laughs> he said, um, you're going to live another 60 years. Okay. Healthy. Cool. Uh, wear your seatbelt. Right, right. That's what's that, gonna. That's what's gonna get that, you. That thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so I'm gonna say to to all of you, your, your median expected age is 120 plus. Hmm. Now, of course, the dream is, um, how fast are we aging, and can you right, right. slow that down? Yeah. So you're active to the end, and you can imagine. Well, the dream is, you know here would be a dream. This is not reality, right? If my, if my chronological clock says almost 60, mm. and if I can keep my biological clock at almost 60, mm. as my chronological clock keeps ticking, mm -hmm. right? That would be, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that that's going to happen. Yeah. I think we are, we are beginning to touch some very deep understandings of mm -hmm of what happened there was a there was a great compromise made billions of years ago when cells started clumping together into yeah. organisms mm -hmm. and they had to control the infinite division of their neighboring cells mm -hmm. so that they could function in tissues and organs right and this controlling of division and replication seems to be fundamental in cancer mm -hmm. it seems to be fundamental in aging and we're very far from understanding it. I yeah. think the big question in biology and AI right now is, do we have enough data that exists right now that's clean and reproducible so that we can feed it into the AIs, they can guess the next set of data, mm -hmm. feed that back in, and now it just knows everything? Mm -hmm. Or do we need a lot more data? And this is a, there's, there's a raging debate I think that you know, if there's one thing I learned from going to medical school, I came out thinking it's amazing that it ever works, that any of it ever works. It is so complicated. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. what's happened in the 30 years since I went to medical school means that what mm -hmm. I learned in medical school is a tiny corner of yeah. what we know now. And, and I expect that what we know today is a tiny corner of what we need to know. So it's it's not obvious to me that we have enough data or that we're going to have enough data. Medicine biology may just be that hard, and I can mm -hmm. find myself, you know, hanging my head in shame that I thought we were going to have liftoff this decade and fifty years from now we're still figuring this out. And this is sort of the sort of the disappointment of the genome project, right? We thought, oh my goodness, so much would come out of that, and we got we got so excited yeah. about that, and I remember. When I was in med school, we used to call the non-coding DNA, it was still called junk DNA. Mm. Think of the arrogance of that, right? Using the word junk, right. when we Not could important. have said, we have no idea what it's there for, <laughs> and it's therefore it's probably really important. And it turns mm. out it's all these regulatory sequences, super important. Yeah. And 
the the diseases that correspond to a single gene knockout, 4,000 of them or so, we understand those really well. It just mm -hmm. turns out that most of the the conditions are are way more complicated than that. Yeah. They're gene networks interacting in ways that we barely understand. And so we're very far away. Yeah. Um let me talk about the company you're also a part of early. Is that right? Ah, uh, yes. No, it's like Grail, correct? I'm an advisor. Um, we would say it's different. I mean, but... I should explain what <laughs> that is. Uh, for... the, the idea about early is a fascinating little company here in, in the Bay Area is to make cancers declare themselves, literally light them up so you can see them and know exactly where they are when mm -hmm. they are still a few cells. Very the awesome. problem is that by the time a tumor is symptomatic, it's usually billions of cells mm. and it's very hard to kill. And all of our techniques are basically, it's like killing a fly with a cannonball, right? We're just mm -hmm. going to aim this at a bunch of cells. It's going to kill a lot of you, but there's more of you than there is of the tumor. That's kind of the state of the art. Mm. So if we could go in when a tumor was very small, and irradiate it or excise it, that's it. So, so early yeah. is different than Grail in that early is early wants to localize the tumor and tell you exactly where it is. Whereas Grail will just say you have a tumor somewhere. I see. Boy, so many questions. How are we doing on time, by the way? Yeah, please, we should turn to audience questions. Oh man, I got so many questions to ask you. <laughs> okay, all right. We got to do this as a speaker series, just but just with him. Oh uh, yeah. You guys can connect. <laughs> okay. All right, so we're going to Q and A then. All right. So I was going to ask you about climate. I was going to ask you about Ooh. Unicon. Oh. <laughs> All right. Talk afterwards. Okay. Okay. So we have Paul Glanting, our director of career services. So I think we might actually go straight to students. Okay. I think their voices are okay. What we want to hear. Um. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Lisa. I'm a second year student in business administration and marketing. And my question is, um, imagine you're a student. So what resources would you recommend using outside of the classroom to help uh, boosting your awareness about business and finance work? Oh, wow. Thank you. What a great. So, um, well, I'll do a, a commercial for uh, for my class. So I taught a, a class at, at Stanford GSB, um, but the class is free, so it's on my website. Um, it's just my name, rmartinchavez.com. And um, I did a little agreement with Stanford and I just put everything on my website. Um, it's called How Software Ate Finance. That's the name of the class. And I at attempt to cover everything in finance except for insurance, which I know nothing about. Um, and and the inter intersection with software. You can also, if you want, uh, take it for Coursera credit. Um, I think you pay forty bucks, and then you get to put it on your LinkedIn profile. But it's the it's the same materials. Um, but then I, I'll do a commercial for Coursera. I don't have any commercial relationship with them. I think Coursera is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I I take I'm always taking Coursera classes. I I take them in. Um, music theory. It's one of my regrets. I know nothing about music theory, but Coursera is the answer. And so I've taken, um, I think it's still important to keep your skills fresh. And so people either find this really cute or strange, but I still write software. Um, and so in the last few years, I've learned Scala and Julia mm -hmm. um, because you know, no one really should be using C++ anymore. And and I learned all of that on Coursera. It's really great. So that's, that's learning how to learn, right? Learning how to Always learn. Always learn, right? And, it's, and Coursera also makes it easy for you. They have um, a certificate series. So just go to the data science certificate series or the machine learning certificate series and take, take the classes. I can tell you employers care about this. Yeah. Um, you know, it's great. The employers want credentials still. I'm not in the Silicon Valley camp that says, oh, drop out of school. I know people say that. You will not hear hear me say that. Um, and employers also want to see that you can actually do something, right? So, so when we interview for quants or data scientists at, at Sixth Street, 
we we say, please take out a piece of paper and can you write a sorting algorithm? Pick whatever language you want, right? We want to actually see how people think. And so being able to, you know, acquire those actual skills, super important. I think we got five more minutes. So let's make sure we get some more questions here. So uh, are we over here then or, oh, right here. We'll come back there. Hi. Yeah. So my name is Arnav Saxena. Uh, I'm a finance and I'm second year here. Um, what is the hardest lesson you learned when entering your field? And what was the lesson that you learned when you were exiting your field? Or like you're still in it, but like mm. later on in your life, what was like the hardest lesson you learned? Wow. Um, so we like to say at, at Sixth Street, and we borrow this from the coach of a uh, basketball team where we're part owner, San Antonio Spurs, um, have you gotten over yourself yet? That's a that's an interview question, and so so I think that's that's it, right? I'm, I, we're all still getting over ourselves and our issues and our drama and our our solipsism. Um, I found being a CFO of Goldman Sachs to be an incredible honor, and also um, the hardest thing I've ever I've ever done. And so I'll leave you with the, the same uh, somewhat cryptic line that I gave to the Wall Street Journal. The uh, journalist asked me, so what's what's your conclusion about having been CFO of Goldman Sachs? And I said, it was amazing preparation for something. I still don't know what that something is yet. <laughs> That's good. Let's see, I think we over here. Should we go in? Hi, my name is Chit Kumar Rokar and I'm second year finance major. So I have two questions. First one is how did you network with people in your initial phase of career? And second one is what are the questions asked in CEO job interview? Oh, wow. <laughs> questions asked in the CEO job interview. Uh, yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, okay. So I know networking is a big concept um i hate it i don't really believe in it i remember once um i got very angry at a junior professional um who got on my calendar and i said as far as we know all you have done in the last year is show that you can get on everyone's calendar and network <clears throat> right we, we, so but your actual work product doesn't exist and so i just modify like networking fine make sure that there's also work right a, a work product goes along with it it makes you more interesting and i would say uh, attraction not promotion right so uh very important slogan to keep in mind right are are you going to be someone that people want to talk with hang out with exchange business cards with or are you just pushing yourself and people at a very instinctive level can tell the tell the difference um questions in a ceo job interview well i've only been um ceo i guess only once in my in my startup um so i'll, I'll modify uh your question to say what i got asked in the discussion about being CFO. So it's a, uh, it's close. Right. Um, and so, uh, the boss says you're going to be the next CFO. And I look down at the ground and he said, all right, let's hear the objections. And I said, uh, I'm not an accountant. And he said, nice try. You have 3000 accountants. You can trust. Absolutely. And, I should say this, one of my great regrets is not knowing, not ever having seriously studied accounting. Huge miss mm -hmm. in my career. If I could do it all over again, that's the one thing I would fix. And have, I know many of you are accounting majors, so I was not paid to say that. It's just, it's just, it's just how I think. And then this the second objection I had was I said, when I picture myself hosting the earnings call. I do not feel happiness. And he said, that only demonstrates your sanity. 
And so now you know two questions asked. And, and I agree with that accounting good. comments, the language of business. So super, yeah, taking up accounting is super, super important. Do we have time for one more? Is that okay? Final question. Okay. Are we here? Hey, thank you. Uh, my name is Marco. I graduated last semester with my master's in quantitative economics. Um, and I, one of my questions is what hard technical skills would you recommend focusing on given this current job market and what skills kind of guys you answered this last but what skills would you focus on if you were in your early 20s and yeah. would want to scale up again well you know accounting is what i would do uh differently and you may be you may be hearing um there's a mm -hmm. certain thread out there that the AIs are so good at coding that don't bother. I I think that's insane. I think that's just mm -hmm. all wrong. Um, and so I would not fall for that. Now, um, I think of coding as very similar to writing a concise and compelling essay in English, right? Everybody needs to be able to do that. Very few people are going to write essays for the New Yorker, right? But everybody needs to be able to do it. The same with coding. Very few people are going to be professional software engineers. And by the way, I think that this, the, the craft of software engineering is going to change and it's going to generalize. It's become more abstract as you've got co-pilots and other things doing a lot of things side by side with you. But I've seen this movie before in so many areas of Wall Street. The activity doesn't go away and get done entirely by computers, but the activity becomes much more abstract. And so traders who were just making markets and five stocks all day, they got completely destroyed and replaced by computers. But traders who can make risk judgments across a vast complex of risk with the computers doing all the individual buys and sells, those people are more valuable than ever before. So to answer your question, absolutely everybody in this room needs to understand the algorithmic data-driven approach to problem solving and doing a little coding along the way to acquire that skill is valuable, but the skill is the data-driven algorithmic approach to problem solving, not the actual coding. So that speaks to creativity, right? It's the creative this. I don't see that going away ever. Cool. Good. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This is absolutely fascinating. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to thank all of you. We have a reception outside, uh, including box lunches. Please stay, mingle with our um, speakers, and uh, please stay on till two o'clock. And I want to thank both Mr. Chavez and, and Chris Larson for this wonderful discussion. I think we could have gone on for another hour. Thank you so much. And I want to thank my colleagues. Uh, who send their students here, and also Marcy Potter, uh, Paul Glanting, uh, and other, other colleagues, Jeff O'Toole, and other colleagues who helped put this thing together. Thank you very much.